So I will give a big hello to everyone who's out there listening in the audience. And I also want to make sure and say happy June Dairy Month. I um, hope that you're all having the opportunity to celebrate Dairy Month in some way um, by eating some extra dairy treats or enjoying some cheese. Um, do what you can to support those dairy farmers, right? My name is Abby Bauer, and I'm an associate editor for Horde Dairyman Magazine. We welcome you to our monthly webinar series, which is co-hosted by Horde Dairyman and the University of Illinois. Today, our webinar is titled, Milk, What Can Lactation Teach Us About Diet and Health? And our presenter, who is brand new to our webinar series, um, we haven't had him speak for us before, is Bruce German, and he is from the University of California, Davis. We're very pleased to have him on board today. Um, since it is June Dairy Month, we kind of went with a little bit of a different theme, and we're talking very specifically about milk and how it impacts human health, affecting um, diet, weight, immunity, um, things like that. So we're excited to have Dr. German on board and to share with us some of his research and findings that he can um, share with our group today. Um, and we thought June Dairy Month would be a perfect time to learn about his research and focus on milk, which um, is one of most, Mother Nature's most nearly perfect foods. So once again, we're very excited to hear from you today, Dr. German. Um, if you're listening to the presentation live, you have access to the PDF slides. You can find those in the handout section of the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, there's PDFs. You can click on those, print them out, and then you can take notes or save them for later reference. Also, if you have any questions that come up during the presentation, please type those in to the questions section, and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. And feel free to put in any questions or comments as we go along. Our webinar team consists of Jim Baltz at the University of Illinois, our Hortz Dairyman Online Media Manager, Patty Hurchin, and then uh, my co-host for the day is Mike Hutchins, and he also comes to us from the University of Illinois and is a well-known speaker and um, dairy researcher there working in nutrition for dairy nutrition for many years. So, Mike, um, if you would, please introduce Dr. German farther and then get this webinar started. Well, thank you very much, Abby, and it's my uh, professional pleasure to introduce Dr. Bruce German. Uh, Bruce uh, grew up uh, near Toronto, Canada, got his uh, BS and master's degree at the University of Western Ontario, and then journeyed south to the border down to uh, Cornell and got his PhD degree at that institution. And then in 1988, we're going to date you a little bit there, Bruce, he uh, journeyed to California and has been there for 42 years at this point. He is director of food for Health Institute and a professor at the University of California. He works extensively in, in the dairy sector area here and has published more than 450 papers uh, in various uh, publications as far as that goes. He has two daughters and he said when it gets below 70 degrees, uh, he thinks it's pretty chilly, but I bet you Cornell was an eye-opening experience. So Bruce, I'll take no more time. I'll turn it over to you and welcome you to the Hordes Dairyman webinar. Thanks very much, Mike. I'm delighted to be here and uh, talk about what we do and how it impacts dairy. So just very quickly, jumping into the meat of the talk, I represent the Foods for Health Institute. Uh, it's a program across the University of California, Davis, with very simple mission. What should we eat? And what should we grow in the 21st century? So given that, we want to put that in some context. Uh, we should be enjoying the best health in human history uh, as humans. And some are. Jaring and Roger are playing the sports they learned as children. They're both over 100. So some people are enjoying spectacular health. Unfortunately, the majority of people are not. And around the world, we're now suffering from diet-dependent diseases. We're picking the wrong diets, and those are having a deleterious effect on our health. So I'm going to take you through how we got here. How did, uh, how did this opportunity, this potential for great health, get squandered? So I want to talk about uh, the golden age of nutrition, uh, when things were, in essence, spectacularly successful. And then talk about the not so golden age, uh, the period at the end of the 20th century, and then transitioned into what, what's going on now and, and how we're looking at the future. So 
how did we get so successful at the science of nutrition? Because of chemistry. Chemistry is a science that we call reductionist. Chemistry takes things apart and understands them as individual components. This has been a spectacularly successful science. It has changed the world by taking complicated uh, elements apart and studying them as individual molecules. Chemistry has changed the world, discovering how to make structures, polymers, fuels. Uh, the world now is powered by, structured by chemistry. Magnificent success. And in terms of nutrition, perhaps one of the greatest successes in human history. Chemists took food apart into its constituent chemicals and used that to identify all of the essential nutrients. We know now every single vitamin, every single mineral that humans need to grow and reproduce. That has been a spectacular achievement. And we have to say that not surprisingly, as we understood all of the essential nutrients, we eradicated the essential nutrient deficiency diseases. So young people today don't even know what goiter, rickets, beriberi even look like. The elimination of those diseases, spectacular success. And not surprisingly, that was the golden age of dairy because it was appreciated that milk contains all of the essential nutrients in appropriate amounts. So the golden age of science and nutrition, figuring out all the essential nutrients and deploying those nutrients to the food supplies to make sure that no one got deficiency diseases. Spectacular success. The good news is no more deficiency diseases. The bad news was that science basically assumed that we were done, didn't have to study food anymore, and it moved on. And it moved on the studying disease. And in fact, most of the last 50 years of science has been directed towards diseases and curing diseases, especially those of middle-aged rich men. And that has been the, the golden era of pharmaceuticals, drugs, and a couple of important assumptions to those successes are important to recognize. One, we were focusing on diseases. What diseases do people get and what drugs might cure them? And in pursuing that, diseases like heart disease, the focus of most of the research, heart disease takes a long time to develop. So what happened was scientists didn't look for the disease, they looked at biomarkers of the future disease. And so the disease research enterprise looked for drugs that would help disease, especially heart disease, and use biomarkers as the index. So our first pop quiz, what was the biomarker for heart disease risk that literally changed research and drugs? Okay, so now our, our, our people should be able should be able to vote on this. You have uh, four choices. Um, the, the biomarkers for heart disease, uh, glucose, cholesterol, salt, and carbon dioxide. I know what I'm gonna vote. Abby, do you wanna vote? Yeah, my my vote would be cholesterol. What do yeah, you say? I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna join you as well. And I tell you, we're gonna be able to show this. They are rapidly voting. We got a big crowd out there as well. We're gonna give you another three seconds to vote. We had two thirds the vote in. So Jim, let's go ahead and share that vote. Uh, and uh, see if uh, Dr. German has any any comments or words of wisdom. Very impressive. Uh, the cholesterol education program in the United States has been very successful at teaching you the risk factor for heart disease. So, unfortunately, cholesterol in blood as a biomarker of heart disease is a good biomarker for genetic predisposition to heart disease, and even for some drugs. Unfortunately, it's emerging that it's not a very good biomarker of the alteration in risk due to diet. But because 
cholesterol is associated with a wide variety of foods and risk of heart disease was implicated as one of the consequences of, uh, of cholesterol rich foods that had a dramatic effect on the value of foods. And as more and more people began to suffer from, uh, from diseases associated with diet, certain foods were assigned to be the problem. And one of the consequences of that is poor health, increasingly poor health due to diet, destroyed the value of many foods. And dairy is the most vivid of that. So just as an example, uh, when you go through the Sacramento airport, as many airports, you go through security. And uh, of course, what the security does is take away your beverage. You go through the security, uh, and not a surprise, there's a kiosk to sell you back single serve beverages for the flight. Sacramento Airport, water and milk are side by side. What's cheaper? The milk. What does that mean from a value perspective? It means, according to price, California farmers are lowering the value of water by putting it through their cows. This is a disastrous value proposition for an industry like dairy. How can you possibly profit when you're, you're considered to be of lower value than water? But now let's put that price in context. If it's literally cheaper than water, it must be toxic. Is that true? Well, let's put it in context of the Sacramento airport. You're about to be literally tied to a chair for hours. That's what happens in an airplane flight. Now being tied and immobilized for hours begins to have interesting consequences to your health. Because you're immobilized, your bones literally slowly begin to deteriorate. Your muscles begin to atrophy. Your immune system begins to senesce and your physiological system begins to degrade in its performance. Just a tiny bit, but that's what's happening to you while you're on that plane. And what's the only thing that has been shown to have a benefit to all of those properties that are deteriorating in you? Milk. So cheaper than water? So we can extend that. Let's look at the history of humans. So it turns out that dairying as an agricultural choice emerged in four places in the world about 10,000 years ago. Two places in West India, uh, and one in Africa, and Northern Europe. And this is a map of, the, in essence, the genetics of humans. It turns out in those four places, in, uh, in Africa and Europe, an interesting mutation appeared. And that mutation is in humans. In fact, the increasingly red color is the predominance of the rare mutation amongst the human population. These people are mutants. They're in essence, X-Men. And their superpower is that they can digest lactose throughout their lives. The mutation was in the gene regulating the enzyme lactose, lactase. So in effect, what's happening is in the places that had dairying as an agricultural food choice, the ability of people who didn't have this mutation to survive went down. In essence, everybody who didn't have the mutation didn't survive. They have no descendants. What that means is, Milk effectively saved the people who were there. So the ability to digest lactose your entire life as an adult became the strongest selective pressure for humans where dairying was available. Again, cheaper than water? And then finally, let's go to the elephant in the room. Does milk really cause heart disease? So in fact, remember, all of the research implicating diet in heart disease risk was associated with cholesterol as a biomarker. 
studies did not go on and ask, does it really affect heart disease and death? So the scientist in the United Kingdom, Peter Elwood, went ahead and studied the effective diet, not on biomarkers, but on death itself. And he collected data from across the United Kingdom and took disease outcome as death and behaviors and dietary habits during your life. And he was interested in how much of an effect dairy consumption had on heart disease. And of course, at the time, he assumed that consuming dairy products increased your risk of heart disease. And so this is a plot of the relative risk of dying from ischemic heart disease, heart disease as a function of consuming dairy products. So if the population who consumed dairy is compared against the population who didn't, if there is no effect on risk, then the relative risk is one. If the risk of heart disease when you consume dairy products is twice as much, then the relative risk is two. But what Peter found was that the relative risk of dying of heart disease in the United Kingdom, if you consume dairy products, was 0.84. In fact, dairy was protective of heart disease. People died less from heart disease. So we went on and began to look at other diseases. Stroke, dairy was protective. Diabetes, dairy was protective. Colorectal cancer, bladder cancer, virtually every condition that Peter looked at, the population was protected if they consumed dairy products. So clearly the assumption that dairy is a predictor, in fact, a risk factor for heart disease and other metabolic diseases turns out not to be correct. Now, interestingly, and in the interest of, uh, of, of, of completion, he did find one condition that was slightly raised by, uh, by con consuming dairy products uh, and, and almost by poetic justice, um, prostate cancer. The, the disease of old men. So this is a very small effect, um, in fact, only barely uh, detectable. However, there's two ways to interpret these data. One, um, as men get older, the risk of prostate cancer actually increases. Uh, and eventually, if you live long enough, you will get uh, uh, statistically a high risk of prostate cancer. So it could be that uh, the dairy consumption actually increases slightly the risk of prostate cancer, but it's also possible that by consuming dairy products, you live long enough to get uh, prostate cancer. Ultimately, we have a pretty clear answer to the question, is dairy consumption driving heart disease and other metabolic, cardiometabolic diseases? No. So we decided that there needed to be a different way to look at diet. And so 20 years ago, we began to take a different approach to, uh, to diet and health, not looking at diseases, but looking at health itself. And answering the broad question, what should we eat in order to protect ourselves and prevent diseases from developing? And we decided to ask evolution. So this is the phylogenetic tree of bacteria and, uh, and eukaryotes. Um, Turns out that the world is mostly microbial. Uh, animals, plants are small branches on the tree of life. Uh, and we decided to ask a very simple question. Food. What evolved to be food? To protect, to prevent diseases. Uh, when you ask that question of evolution, actually you get a rather clear answer. Now, the strongest selective pressure through evolution is to avoid being eaten. It's a war out there. And plants and animals that are delicious and nutritious don't last very long. And so they have all sorts of strategies to avoid being eaten. So in answer to this simple question, in essence, what evolved to be 
food, <laughs> not much. Most things evolved to avoid being food. But of course, we have to think about evolution in terms of how it works. Evolution is a very tough taskmaster. You get to the next generation by survival. If a trait develops in a population, it's because those who don't have it have died. So evolution is very tough. So looking at evolution from the perspective of food is a way to see how very important components of diet emerge. In fact, uh, there's an award given every year for people who voluntarily, <laughs> through, through stupidity, take themselves out of the gene pool. Those are called the Darwin Awards. And they refer to people who have, through uh, inadvertence or sheer stupidity, managed to take themselves out of the gene pool, as this image would imply. So, Mike, next poll question. Yes, so we have another poll question, and this gets exciting. And the question is, uh, the leading trait of a Darwin Award is age, health, education or gender and abby you are going to earn your uh, your your uh, uh spurs on this one here because i think this is a really tough question do you want to take a swing at this one abby i can i was going to say i'm much less confident about this answer than i was the last one i i will go with health mike what do you say wow i um just be devil's advocate. I'll pick. I'll pick education. I'll just pick education. Okay. Um, for no no parent. Why would you pick health? We're still coming in here. We got a few more minutes to go here. Uh, boy, I tell you, Bruce, uh, it's it's a real mix. <laughs> anyway, anyway, we're at sixty five percent. So Jim, let's close the poll, and uh, Bruce, we'll let you discuss it. All right. Well, actually, um, if we go to the next slide. Since we've had pretty much uniform responses, um, I'll show you what the breakdown of the Darwin Awards are. And you can tell which was the most important determinant. <laughs> These are the Darwin Awards by gender. Um, <laughs> men are by far and away most common winners of so men we got to do a better job so given how tough evolution is and our desire to find something that genuinely evolved to be nourishing uh we found the in essence the most remarkable biological engine of nourishment lactation uh milk uh the the decision actually quite late in animal evolution where mammals, mammalian mothers, literally dissolved themselves to make a complete diet for their infants. It's an astonishing process. And of course, because mothers are basically dissolving themselves to make a complete diet, everything is valuable to the baby because it costs the mother. And anything in milk is evolving under the selective pressure of providing nourishment and protection prevention for infants. Turns out to be the perfect model that we can use to study how should we understand how diet can affect our health for benefit, for prevention. So we've been studying this for years. We have a consortium of scientists from around the world. We have a journal called Splash. If you're interested in any of the scientific breakthroughs in milk over the past 20 years, they're written up in, uh, in essence, articles for the average reader in the journal Splash. It's free, available to anyone, and explains lactation. We study lactation from marsupials, kangaroos, to humans. Trying to understand how does milk provide the benefits to health of infants. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples. I could spend hours talking about all of the things about milk, but I want to give you two things that we, we 
came across that have been a, a spectacular surprise as to how milk works. So one, how does milk view bacteria? Now remember, milk is the result of the production of a bioreactor, the mammary gland in mothers. They're literally dissolving themselves to make it. Everything costs them. If it doesn't help the infant, then the cost of the mother will drive that component out of, uh, of milk. If it provides a benefit to the infant, it's hard to ima imagine anything under more positive selective pressure. But with this cost-benefit relationship, we began to look at milk chemically. And one of the things that was a complete and utter surprise, the third most abundant class of biomolecules in human breast milk is undigestible by babies. Why would mothers dissolve themselves to make a poop in a baby? So first question, what are they? So Carlito Labrilla, world famous uh, chemist at University of California, Davis, he developed analytical procedures to figure out what these molecules were. And what they are is complicated sugar polymers, different sugars held together in ways that uh, make them undigestible, unabsorbable to babies. So we now have the means to look at all of these molecules in milk, and milk is full of them. So if mothers are assembling these complicated sugar polymers and putting them into breast milk, but the baby can't digest them, why would mothers do that? So we were, in essence, convinced that, well, if they don't feed the baby, maybe they feed something else. Maybe they feed bacteria. So David Mills, again, world famous microbiologist. He studies bacteria in all sorts of complicated ecosystems, including the human intestine. And we isolated these complex sugar polymers for milk and used them to see if bacteria could grow on them. And to our surprise, they did not. These oligosaccharides didn't support the growth of bacteria any better than they support the growth of babies. So David tried bacterium after bacterium after bacterium. No growth. And then we found one. Oh, what a surprise from the intestine of a breastfed baby. So Bifidobacterium infantis. We sequenced this uh, bacteria's genome, and lo and behold, for all of those complicated sugar polymers, and the bonds that hold them together, this bacteria has enzymes to break down and access those sugars. This bacteria grows on oligosaccharides from human breast milk better than it grows on glucose. It's clearly a brilliant idea from evolution. Mothers are recruiting another life form to babysit their baby. And they're making sure that this life form flourishes because it's the one they feed. So now we realize that evolution actually wasn't just favoring milk and babies, it was in essence selecting for bacteria that would grow in the baby and grow on breast milk. And it's this complicated relationship of mothers guiding the bacterial population in their infants that has been one of the unique benefits to breast milk in babies. So we immediately began to ask, well, who could, in essence, could use this? And it turns out there's a first customer. So of course, breastfeed, breastfeed, breastfeed. Breastfeeding clearly is necessary to this, but we found another customer. Mark Underwood, head of neonatology, he works with premature babies. We have many premature babies uh, born today. 10% of babies are born premature, and they're typically born by cesarean section. What that means is they're born sterile. They don't get any bacteria from their mothers. Mark takes them sterile from the mothers, puts them in an incubator, and then those babies begin to acquire bacteria that will live on and in them for the rest of their lives. And where are those bacteria coming from? The hospital. This is not the way you'd like to start life. So we asked a simple question. 
if you give the premature baby, right, and we measured babies and the bacteria in babies, and they were full of all sorts of bacteria, most of them unpleasant bacteria, not particularly supportive of the health of the baby. But if we give those babies bifidobacteria infantis, within 24 hours, over 90% of the bacteria within that baby is bifidobacteria infantis. And it protects the baby. It fuels the baby. It converts the oligosaccharides to various nutrients that help the baby. And it drops the population of unpleasant bacteria and it even lowers inflammation. This was a remarkable, in essence, discovery that milk is favoring this specific bacteria. And when that bacteria grows, bad bacteria are pushed out. This is a poopogram. This is what's coming out of two breastfed babies. On the top is what's coming out of a breastfed baby that doesn't have the right bacteria. The oligosaccharides, human milk oligosaccharides, are basically coming out of the baby all day. Uh, babies that are breastfed that don't have the right bacteria have typically four to seven diapers a day. Um, they're watery stools and the pH is six. However, the poopogram on the bottom is a baby that got the right bacteria. And literally within hours, the oligosaccharides disappear and they're replaced by the metabolites of the, the bacteria. And these are fuel molecules, acetate and lactate. They help fuel the baby's intestine and they lower the pH and discourage pathogens. In fact, if the lower intestine lumen contents of a breastfed baby that has the right bacteria is pH 4.5. And, and pathogens cannot grow at pH 4.5. So what have we learned? Mammals have embraced a remarkable style of birth, live birth. And what that means is when the baby is born, the mother transfers her bacteria to her infant. And that allows the establishment of the appropriate bacterial colony and the mother's milk then feeds this bacteria. It's a remarkable idea. It's, it's evolution's idea and mammals have embraced it. Unfortunately, modern medicine, hospital care have interrupted this bacterial transfer for all the best reasons to avoid pathogens, etc. But no one was paying attention that there are good bacteria that are transferring from mother to baby. And unfortunately, we've lost them. Oops, this really was a mistake. So we're in the process now of putting them back. So uh, the university and faculty who were involved in the research launched a company uh, involved with the product of Evo to put the bacteria back in babies. And, uh, and, and we're now providing this product for, uh, for babies in the United States and around the world. So what have we learned? We're not alone. The bacteria in us are vitally important to our health. And the population varies. The population varies with the bacteria we're exposed to. It varies with the foods we eat. Evolution clearly realized how important this process is. There's as much complex oligosaccharides in human breast milk as there is protein. So from an evolutionary perspective, it's as important for the mother to feed the bacteria in the baby as the baby. This illustrates just how vital the bacteria in us are. So quick question, Mike. Yes, another chance to vote. This is your, I think your last chance to vote. The secret to a protective microbiome of breastfed babies is dirt, hmm, uh, oligosaccharides of milk, the correct strain of bacteria, both the milk and the bacteria. This is a little tricky one as well at this point. Abby, are you ready to vote here? Yes, I am going to select the fourth choice both milk and bacteria. What are you thinking, Mike? 
Yeah, I think I'm going to go there too. I'm, I'm one of those students that when you say all the above or none of the above, I, I really zero, really look at that one pretty carefully as far as that goes. So I think we'll we'll, we'll take 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 our our chance on that. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, uh, yep, we got two thirds of the vote in. Uh, the Democrats are voting today. Let's see what we got. Oh. And it's coming up here. And Bruce, what do you think? Yeah, excellent. Yeah, that that that's an impressive uh, result. It's the combination. You have to get both the bacteria and the oligosaccharides. Uh, if uh, if a baby is formula fed, it doesn't have the oligosaccharides. Even if it gets the right bacteria, it won't grow. And even if it's breastfed, if it doesn't have the right bacteria, then 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 the community doesn't develop. So what we've learned is that combination is is really important. Okay, so one of the things that we've learned, it's not only babies. By understanding the mechanisms by which milk works, we gain the detailed understanding of how diet can work for everyone. What's gonna have to happen over the next few years is we're gonna have to put good bacteria back into people. Because of antibiotic use and hygiene, we have gradually been stripping out the good bacteria in our intestine, and they've been replaced by less beneficial bacteria. In fact, most of the bacteria that come in are, uh, are, are unpleasant and, uh, and inappropriate bacteria. So we're gonna have to put good bacteria back, but we're also gonna have to feed those bacteria. And one of the ways to do that is with milk. Daniela Barilla, a professor at the University of California Davis, has been studying dairy products, dairy streams, to find the oligosaccharides and to isolate them. And what she's found, this is a basically a plot of the oligosaccharides in bovine cow's milk, in colostrum and mature milk. And one of the things that Daniela discovered is that colostrum is full of complex oligosaccharides. However, at about day six, the milk composition changes, becomes mature milk, and the oligosaccharides go down. So mature milk is relatively low in oligosaccharides. Daniela has shown that those oligosaccharides go with whey, and she, so she's been developing ways to isolate the oligosaccharides as biologically active components from whey streams. But of course, what we'd really like is to be able to increase the amount of oligosaccharides in cow's milk close to what it is in human milk. Juan Madrano has worked on the genetics of cows, so we know what those genes are. So now we're looking for cows that produce high levels of oligosaccharides. This would produce high value milk. So what this has taught us is that the bacteria in us are fundamentally important. We're going to need the right bacteria for all sorts of lifestyles and life stages. Um, and that means providing bacteria in foods. Um, that doesn't sound very attractive, but in point of fact, if you look at the foods that have emerged through culinary history as being both nutritious and delicious, coffee, chocolate, cheese, beer, wine, bread, yogurt, kimchi. They're not commodities. They're a combination of a commodity plus microorganism culture. That means that as we understand the bacteria that we'd like to have in us, we'll be putting them in foods and the foods will be more nourishing and more delicious. So the future of food looks like it's actually gonna be much more attractive than it has been. So that's the bacteria. Let me give you another example, what we've learned about milk that's been astonishing. Okay, premature babies. We've realized that premature babies are a critical focus for research. More and more babies are being born premature and we don't know how to feed them. Even breast milk is in essence evolved for mature infants and it may not be perfect for premature infants. So we've been looking and asking very simple questions. 
For example, can the premature baby even digest it? They're premature. Their, their intestine isn't mature yet. And I'll confess, I was absolutely convinced premature babies could not digest human breast milk proteins. So what we did was we went ahead and asked Mark Underwood, again, neonatologist, could we take milk back out of a baby and see if the baby was able to digest milk normally into from proteins into peptides? So Mark got his milk back from babies at different time points. And these are the data. So in red are the peptides in milk going into a premature baby. And the blue are the peptides coming out of that baby two hours later. What these data show is I was completely wrong. I didn't think premature babies could digest milk, but they're clearly digesting it beautifully. But then we looked very carefully. How are they doing it? So it turns out milk is not being digested in the baby by the baby. It's being digested by the milk. In fact, milk is self-digesting. There are enzymes in milk that attack the proteins and digest them into very specific peptide fragments. Oh my gosh, we had never anticipated that. So what we, did we learn from this? Digestion isn't easy. Proteins are actually difficult to digest. And they're especially difficult for early babies and premature babies. And so you, evolution decided to have proteins that are highly digestible and have enzymes in milk that help with that digestion. Who else doesn't digest proteins very well? Well, it turns out the elderly don't digest proteins very well. The ill uh, and infected don't digest proteins very well. So. Milk proteins are a, a particularly appropriate for anybody in a fragile condition, especially the elderly. And if you don't digest proteins, they don't disappear. They go, in essence, proceed down the intestine and they start stimulating the growth of inappropriate bacteria. And the inappropriate bacteria cause all sorts of intestinal problems. So, what we've learned is that digesting proteins is critical and you need to have highly digestible proteins and some people actually even need enzymes to do that. We also discovered that the peptides, the fragments of proteins that are being produced by the enzymes in milk have specific functions. We've identified peptides, for example, that are antimicrobial to pathogens but allow the growth of the beneficial bacteria that we know are vital for the development of microbial communities in, uh, in babies. So again, the, uh, the university has launched another company with uh, Ishida Shah to take these peptides into uh, uh, people who have an essence need of therapeutic peptides for specific health conditions. So what we've learned over our 20 years of research is that evolution of lactation, milk, has been remarkably valuable to understand how health itself works and how diet can influence that. And in fact, milk has been instrumental in help us, helping us to understand how should we change diet for every age and every condition. In fact, looking at the entire dairy enterprise from breeding how to feed cows, the appropriate processing, uh, the components in it. Should we culture? How do we culture? Uh, dairy should become the probiotic delivery system for uh, the future of our microbial communities. We have stripped the microbes out of our uh, food supply and out of us. We've got to put them back, but we have to put the right bacteria back. And we have to ensure that they're, in essence, well fed. So. We are quite confident that the research that we've developed understanding uh, lactation and milk is a guiding system for next generation of dairy products. So my recommendations for the dairy industry is uh, 
is, is they should think about lactation more broadly. Uh, human milk doesn't have significant support. Mothers uh, are, are basically on their own. There's no support systems. No one is supporting the research and, and how to understand human milk. Dairy should, in essence, become the leading global advocate for milk of all kinds, especially human milk. By embracing health as a, an outcome, we know that what has to happen is we have to be able to measure it. And the technologies to measure health are emerging in the dairy sector and they're emerging, emerging in the human sector. Dairy farmers are measuring their cows more and more for their health. And we should be measuring humans and our health more and more. As we measure our health more and more, we will be better able to determine what diets are good for us and what diets are not. And in that context, dairy products will be shown clearly to be beneficial for health. And as that happens, that will change the way we eat. And I would contemplate that it will be a, a significant disruption in agriculture. You'll see entire commodities that will rise and fall based on how well they work on human health. So last thing is, what does this mean for our health in general? What, what could we imagine by understanding health and what milk does for it, how would our, in essence, health change? Well, one of the things we've learned is that milk works on health, not disease. It improves the health of, of babies. Babies build themselves every day and milk guides that construction. Well, it turns out that we rebuild ourselves a little bit every day. And so the diets that we choose affect how much better we do. And so we should be looking at health as an aspirational dimension, not just disease, but how could health actually get better? And when you do that, what you realize is milk is guiding your entire body's health, especially your immune system. So the big challenges that we have today in health are related to the dysfunctions of our immune system. So there is a global epidemic of autoimmunity. More and more children and adults are suffering from allergy, eczema, asthma, diabetes, arthritis, all of these are autoimmune conditions. As we understand and provide diets, we will not only eliminate these autoimmune diseases, we will gain control of our immune system's ability to recognize and respond appropriately to the kinds of threats we have in the world around us. If we had this in place, we would know exactly what diets to recommend for people at risk, for example, of an infectious respiratory disease that we're all seeing spreading around the world as coronavirus. Also, one of the great problems of the immune system today is its inappropriate activation called inflammation. The inappropriate activation of the immune system is driving uh, the severity of cardiovascular disease, uh, various inflammatory diseases, liver diseases, kidney diseases, inflammation is a big problem. And in fact, that's largely driven by inappropriate signaling of the immune system, especially by inappropriate bacteria. So as we understand the bacteria in us, we change those from inappropriate to more beneficial bacteria, we will drop the bottom out of inflammation. We have already seen that in babies who get the right bacteria. Their information, inflammation goes down by 90%. So we would improve not only chronic diseases associated with inflammation, but also the functions of our body. If you race around too much on the weekend, you're sore for Monday and Tuesday. That's inflammation of your joints. Wouldn't you like to be able to control that? It clearly is an advantage that we would gain by understanding how diet and milk affects our immune system. And finally, cardiometabolic control. Right now, we're getting this wrong. And as a result of getting metabolic control wrong, we're seeing obesity, diabetes, chronic fatigue, all the problems of the modern metabolic imbalance. 
So if we could understand how milk achieves its success in babies of metabolic control, then we could translate in this into benefits for all of us. Not only would we eliminate obesity, diabetes, the kind of conditions that come from imbalanced fuel intake and storage, we would be able to direct fuels to activity. We would literally play more because we would have the fuel directed towards the things we would like to do. So what we realized is that milk tells us not only how diet works, but how health works. And in that future, we can imagine it being a very attractive lifestyle for all of us, lifelong. And we can imagine the cow being the center of a very different kind of world, healthier, happier. All right, to the mothers, babies, faculty, students who uh, have, have helped with all of this research and you who listen, thanks very much. Very good, Dr. German, thank you so much for that presentation. And I think you pushed through a lot of information and slides in the time frame, and definitely gave us some things to think about, um, some of the benefits of milk that I don't know that all of us would have connected, you know, as we're involved in the dairy industry, we're always looking for ways to promote dairy, but I think some of your research has highlighted different areas that we could also use as talking points when promoting the dairy products that our dairy farmers produce. Um, I want to point out some of our upcoming webinars that we'll, be, um, ha we'll have in the months ahead. Our July webinar, which will take place on the 13th, will be a discussion about calf management, behavior, and welfare. And that will be presented by Emily Miller Cushion from the University of Florida, and our sponsor there will be Agroplastics. Then our August monthly webinar will be featuring feeding and management in the robotic milking systems. Um, some of the work that's been done in the University of Minnesota, and our presenter will be a dairy educator from University of Minnesota Extension, Jim Selfer, and De La Val is sponsoring that presentation. So please uh, mark your calendars if either of these topics are interesting to you, and we hope that you'll look forward to joining us in one of those future webinars. We had a few questions that came into the questions tab here. Um, again, if any of you have further questions, please type them in now. Um, because I will hand the microphone over to Mike and let him go through the questions and we'll see what Dr. German has to say about um, these, these items that came in during the presentation. Well, thank you very much, Abby. Let's uh, go through very quickly. And we got a lot of questions here, Bruce. So you're under uh, you're under the speed trap here. Uh, th th this one came in from Canada. And as our listeners know, you can send questions ahead. And here's your first one. It says, have you found any type of food in a cow's diet that is de detrimental to the things you were talking about here? In other words, what about silages and grains, rumenzin, which is a, which is a, a rumen modifier uh, drug, uh, palm oil, uh, and minerals. Any comments on that? Sure, great question. Um, in fact, uh, one of the things that, uh, that mammals do is mothers consume mixed diets uh, with various levels of appropriate and inappropriate uh, chemicals in them, and they screen the baby from most of these by, by virtue of keeping them out of, of, of milk. So most of the toxins in the diet are screened out of, uh, of the mammary gland and don't get in milk. However, milk does move some things into, uh, in, into milk. And this is why uh, milk uh, should be screened for things like antibiotics and, uh, and other chemicals that could have biological activity in the babies. Unfortunately, toxicity is diabolically difficult. And you cannot predict the toxicity or even the presence of, of a the toxin in milk uh, from its general class properties. So the, the difficult answer is you have to measure. Uh, fortunately, there are relatively few components that, that actually come into milk, either human uh, or, or cow's milk, that are truly deleterious. Question from Wisconsin uh, is on the screen now. There seems to be a trend of people eliminating dairy from diets for various reasons, including the self-diagnosis of uh, lactose intolerance. Can you comment on the cause and how do we counter those opinions? Sure. Um, again, great question. Uh, remember, 
humans evolved in the presence of lactose uh, and selected for, uh, in essence, a subset who uh, persisted the mutation for being able to digest lactose through life. Um, what that means is uh, the vast majority of mammals lose lactase enzyme at weaning, and that includes most humans. However, the inability to digest lactose isn't toxic. What undigested lactose does is stimulate the growth of bacteria in your intestine. Interestingly, if you have bacteria in your intestine that can, can utilize lactose, but they're beneficial bacteria, then, then you don't see any deleterious symptoms at all. However, if your microbial population contains bacteria that convert lactose into undesirable chemicals, gas and other things, then you see symptoms of lactose intolerance. So um, one of the things to ask is why is it that the people who have the mutation were so successful just because of lactose? Uh, it seems like uh, being able to Digest lactose was very important. And presumably it's because of all the things in milk that, that you could take advantage of. So for, for people who genuinely have symptoms of lactose intolerance, it makes sense to consume dairy products that don't have lactose in them or have the enzyme uh, naturally as in yogurt or explicitly added in, in products like lactate. Another question from the UK, and it says, as an on-farm producer of yogurt, what additional benefits do we get from cultured milk products? Uh, what traits should we select for on the genetic side to increase the functionality of milk for human nutrition? Looks like there's two questions there, Bruce. Uh, I'll let you handle them whichever order you wish. Sure. Yogurt um, is, is basically uh, cultured with uh, bacteria that will digest lactose. And so one of the clear benefits of yogurt is the, 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 the breakdown of lactose, and so the elimination of any risk of, of lactose intolerance. However, many of the products of microbial activity uh, are, are, are beneficial when consumed. So uh, I would love to say that we know all of the things that yogurt does and, uh, and how it works, but if I was to predict what humans are going to be eating more and more of over the next 10 years, it's live bacteria. We've lost them and we've got to get them back. And you're going to have to trust someone to give you live bacteria in your food. Um, this is a, a potentially risky proposition. So an industry that has developed the expertise in delivering live bacteria in a delicious product is ideally situated to become the leader in delivering bacteria of all kinds. So I would predict that yogurt-like products will proliferate and you'll be able to deliver more and more bacteria to, uh, to individuals using milk as a carrier. What about that second? Bull, yeah, in terms of bulls, um, we're desperately looking for bulls who, uh, whose daughters make more oligosaccharides for, uh, for months uh, instead of losing it in the first week. Uh, Dairy cows make all the oligosaccharides that we would like to have. Uh, they just shut them down uh, after about a, a week of colostrum. Um, we're quite confident there's gonna be some bulls out there that make daughters who can do that. It'll be very valuable daughters. I think this is our last question before, and then we got the ones that are coming in rapidly here, Bruce. So we're we're really gonna have to speed her up here. Uh, does okay. abnormal urea level does the abnormal milk urea levels affect nutritional value of milk? Uh, urea is a natural component of milk, both human and bovine. Uh, we don't see evident any evidence that it's deleterious. We don't even know why it's in milk. It could be valuable, but uh, but as long as they're in, in, in relatively normal amounts, we see no deleterious effects whatsoever. Are there any complex sugars in breast milk that are also found in cow's milk? Yes, there's a, a significant overlap. Um, human milk is, is more abundant and more diverse, but and cow's milk less abundant, less diverse, but many of the 
of the oligosaccharides, and many of the functions are shared between the two. Um, the world would be very, very, uh, in essence, lucky to find cows that could make enough oligosaccharides for the demand we perceive. What about uh, for calves? A question comes in. It says cow milk, uh, cow's milk uh, doesn't have the range of the concentration of oligosaccharides. What implication does it have on the gut health and function in a calf? And I'm not sure it's yeah, a newborn calf or just. Yeah. Um, human infants are born very naive, and it takes a long time for them to develop. It, it takes a long time to develop physically, metabolically, immunologically. And so we think part of the reason why the oligosaccharides stay high in humans longer is because of the long development time of human infants. Calves, are, of course, are born uh, as, as prey of predators, ready to gallop, and, and they mature quite quickly. And so the, the development of the microbial community in calves is just compressed over a shorter time window. Uh, if calves can get the right bacteria, they develop the microbial community. It just doesn't take them as long. Another question comes in, Bruce, about fatty acid profiles, especially those that are synthesized in the mammary gland known as the devoid synthesis. Do these fatty acids, uh, these are the shorter chain fatty acids, or have any effect on humans in terms of uh, health and uh, biological effects? Yeah, th th this is this is one of the great discoveries I think coming out of research right now is we looked at milk solely for the fatty acids that that mothers can't make the long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids and no one had the good sense to look at what fatty acids mothers are actually making and when you do that you see across mammals specific fatty acids are maintained remarkably constant. And that tells you it's probably pretty important. And so every single fatty acid that people have looked at carefully, uh, the saturated fatty acids are beneficial. And they're signaling molecules, they're, uh, they're controlling metabolism. We made a huge mistake walking away from the biological value of saturated fatty acids. If you consume too much of anything, it's bad for you. So if you consume massive amounts of saturated fat, fatty acids, it's a problem. But no one really does that practically. But if you eat the right amount, it seems clear now that saturated fatty acids have wonderful benefits. Okay, based on the work you reported on here, uh, there's some real benefits to fluid milk consumption. Uh, or are you emphasizing processed product, especially the fermented products, or just looking at special components of the milk that you need to be extracted and maybe purified down the road? Actually, I, I think there's room for all three. Uh, as, as the health of the consumer becomes more and more important, then the ability to guide their diet more and more carefully and include more and more components that are uniquely beneficial, then we, we think that that need for clinical patients would justify concentrating specific components from milk as therapeutics. Uh, but uh, as we understand the components of milk, one of the things that's clear is milk works as an ensemble and you lose some of the benefits by taking it apart. What we don't do a very good job of is processing milk to retain its natural biological properties. So, as an example, the enzymes in milk that provide the ability to, uh, to, to guide the break breakdown of proteins, uh, we inactivate them by, by thermal processing. So could you imagine that we improve the processing of milk to retain those enzyme activities? The genius of, of these activities is they're, they don't act in milk. They wait until they're in the, the, the in human milk and baby uh, to act. Guiding processing for specific benefits that are already in milk, I think will be the next big, uh, big jump in innovation in dairy processing. Bruce, believe it or not, here's your last question. And I'll just give you a heads up. He did, they just want a clarification. So be thinking about this. I'll okay. pretty much read it the way he did it. He said uh, he was confused when you stated the study that the oleosaccharides did not grow bacteria in the baby's gut and he references to the, the Underwood study, but then you stated that the oleosaccharides help grow the friendly bacteria. 
Uh, do you know what he's confused about? Yeah, or concerned? And, 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 and we were too. This is one of the things that when we started these, these studies decades ago, we thought bacteria had a pretty general capability in growing on carbohydrate. And that if you put carbohydrate in front of bacteria, bacteria would grow on it. What we didn't appreciate is how specific different bacteria are for different food supplies. Humans are generalists. We can digest and, and, and take fuel out of all sorts of molecules. Most bacteria are, are very specific. And that's what evolution took advantage of with mammalian lactation in milk. So by producing complex oligosaccharides that most bacteria cannot grow on, mothers make sure that bad bacteria don't grow in their baby. But then producing oligosaccharides that feed this very specific bifidobacteria, bifidobacteria infantis, evolution has in essence rewarded mothers who produce oligosaccharides that made that bacteria grow. And so what you see is inappropriate bacteria have no food to grow on. Appropriate bifidobacteria infantis has lots of food to grow on. As a result, babies are full of just the one bacteria. It's a brilliant idea. I wish we'd have thought of it. We didn't. We just discovered this is how evolution uh, and milk works. And of course, now our, our, our challenge is how fast can we get this really unusual idea back into all of us so we all have the right bacteria and are feeding the right bacteria. Well, Bruce, my apologies. One more question, stick in, so I'm going to let it come. And it says, uh, is there any important differ difference in comp con differential composition of the milk depending if it's grass-fed uh, or grain-fed uh, in the diet? Well, interestingly, if you look at milk and mothers, one of the things that mothers do is they take all sorts of different diets and they break them down and they make a relatively, in essence, constant product. That's part of the genius of, uh, of, of mammalian mothers. However, in one respect, some things come through from the diet into uh, milk and to the baby, and, uh, and, and it's fascinating. So the flavors. So one of the things that's fascinating about our preference for and against certain foods is we develop olfactory preferences, smell preferences for foods in our lifetime. It's not genetic. We like foods, the smell of foods, because we've learned to like them. And that starts at milk. So mothers are transferring flavors from their diet into the milk and literally teaching the babies the flavors of the foods that the mother is eating. So she's guiding her future baby's food preferences through milk. Fascinating uh, idea of evolution. So in fact, some of the flavors of a grass diet will be in the milk. Some of the flavors from a grain diet will be in the milk. Uh, and, and cheese manufacturers, have used this to their advantage to produce particular uh, flavors and, 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 in essence, benefits to the flavor profile of, uh, of cheeses. But in terms of health benefits, to this point, we don't see any. Uh, diet is, is largely eliminated in diversity by mothers to make uh, an appropriate diet for their baby. Well, very good, Bruce. Abby, I'm going to turn it back to you to end the, the webinar here. And, uh, and Bruce, we had lots of neat, good, positive comments on your presentation as well. Thank you, Mike. And um, thank you to Bruce German for his presentation and for answering that group of questions that came in. We definitely appreciate that additional insight that you could add. Um, we'll, I will point out again our upcoming webinars which happen on the second Monday of each month. In July, we'll be talking about calf management, behavior, and welfare with Emily Miller Cushion. And in August, we will be hearing a presentation by Jim Selfer on feeding and managing cows in robotic milking systems. So please mark your calendars and make plans to attend our future webinars. And as always, I'd like to extend our 
um, thankfulness to all of you in the audience. We appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to spend this hour with us. And we hope that you have gained some valuable information today that you can use on your operations or um, with the clients that you work with. Until next time, I would like to wish you all good health and I hope that you take care. And goodbye from all of us here at Hoard Steerman and the University of Illinois.